I'm Gary Kavner with Gript. I'm here today with Professor Jared Casey, author of Hidden a Gender, Transgenderism, Struggle Against Reality. Professor, it's great to have you on. Thank you, Gary, for having me. I suppose to, to start with, one of the dangers of talking about this issue is that there is a tendency among certain sectors that if you talk about this issue at all in anything but the most believing and positive tones, you are immediately called a transphobe, or they say that what you are saying is, is transphobia. Now, this is a term, that, and this is a style of argumentation that you deal with specifically at the start of your book, mm. where you're trying to, you're making the point that that's a bit of a poisoning of the well. It turns what is a fact about an argument into an attitude towards a group. And I was just hoping you could expand slightly on that as it seems like a good start to the conversation. <laughs> well, yes, well, thank you. Um... Well, the term phobia, obviously Greek in origin, and its use as a suffix in English is normally, uh, it's normally used to refer to an irrational fear or hatred of whatever comes before it. So for example, if you're an arachnophobe, you have an irrational hatred or fear of spiders. Now, if you're, I mean, I don't like spiders. In fact, in our house, my wife takes care of the spiders, but it's not quite irrational and I don't hate them. I just don't want them in the same room with me. Okay, and I'd like them to move elsewhere. So that's fine. So I'm not an arachnophobe, but there are people who are literally terrified out of their minds. In other words, it doesn't make any difference that you say this is a harmless spider, it's not going to do anything to you. They won't go into a bathroom unless they have it kind of vacuumed before they go in and so on. These are arachnophobes. Um, and so I make the point that when I, if I disagree with somebody on a point intellectually, Say, for example, um, let's say, let's say uh, you're a materialist and you think that everything in the universe is simply matter in motion of one kind or another, and that e everything, all phenomena, including mental phenomena, intentionality, beliefs, and so on, can be explained ultimately uh, in material terms. You're a materialist. I'm not a materialist. I would then disagree with you, and we could argue on it. But I'm not a materialist or phobe. I don't hate you, <laughs> I don't fear you. I don't have an irrational hatred or fear of you. So merely the fact that you disagree with somebody on a particular point doesn't make you phobic in relation to them. So when it comes to transgender issues, I don't have an irrational hatred or fear of transgender people. I'm quite happy uh, as I will, you know, as I've said in the book, that competent adults can make whatever decisions they like in, the, in, in this regard. I don't fear them. Um, and therefore, there is no sense in which, unless you want to use it as a sort of generalized term of abuse, there's no sense in which I'm transphobic. It doesn't make any sense. But of course, we know that um, the rhetorical effect of the phobic suffix is such that people are terrified to be called anything phobic, uh, whatever that might be. And therefore, they, they engage then in self-censorship. And of course, the strategy of using such terms in this way, not specific way, which doesn't really mean anything, is simply to sh shut down the conversation preemptively. What was it about this area that, that particularly interested you, even as part of this project? Well, there are a couple of aspects. I mean, the probably the more interesting aspect is the sort of uh, what you might call, if you want to be really grandiose, the philosophical anthropo anthropological, in other words, the kind of uh, what conception of human beings we're dealing with. But the practical issue really has to do with the following. And I, 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 maybe this is a good opportunity to make it absolutely clear what I am doing and what I'm not doing. I'm not telling anybody what they may or may not do, okay, when it comes to issues of transgender. I'm not telling them that they may not change their gender or attempt to do so or have a surgery or hormonal treatment or anything like that, especially if we're talking about adults, children or another case. What I'm really interested in the fact is the fact that um, both informally through social media and social pressure, but more significantly through legal means, people like me who don't believe that you can actually change your sex are being forced by law to accede to what it is that other people are doing and to their self-description and not just to tolerate what they're doing, which is fine, I have no problem with that, but to actually subscribe to it at the cost of sanctions if I refuse to do so. And I'm not making this up. I mean, people have lost their jobs and been fired 
uh, because they have expressed what are known as gender critical views. We have in this country, many people may not realize that we have a Gender Recognition Act, which allows people uh, to change their sex legally, which is quite extraordinary. And the same is true of the United Kingdom. And then consequent upon that, of course, there are equality acts. And when you put all of those together, you find that you, 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 you discover that you can, be at, uh, uh, you can be prosecuted and lose your job if you refuse to speak in certain ways. So we're talking about forced speech here. And that's what I'm really concerned about. That, that's really the, the focus. Don't care what other people do. I'm a libertarian. It's not my problem, <laughs> okay? You go and do it if you want to do it. But I'm concerned about what I and others who think like me are being forced to do. Was there any particular point, any particular time or instant where you started to become concerned in that side of things that this was moving from a personal choice that someone thought would bring them uh, better mental stability or happiness into an attempt to enforce sort of norms in this area? Uh, yes, the answer is when I discovered that we actually had a Gender Recognition Act, something that I would suggest probably everybody in this country is unaware of. Now, it's interesting that it's called a Gender Recognition Act and not a Sex Recognition Act, but the significant passage in the Act goes, I, I can't quote you know, from memory, but it goes something like, when a person's gender is a person's gender, and then the word gender is used frequently, and then on the very last line, it says, and then their sex shall be following. So now, this brings us to another point. I mean, um, one, of the, one of the things, the, the sources of multitudinous confusion in this area is the distinction or lack of distinction between sex and gender. If sex and gender mean the same thing, then obviously you can't change your gender, right? Because there are only two sexes and you are what you are. If gender, however, is something different, which uh, given its sort of uh, genesis in the uh, women's movement, it's very often taken to be, in other words, where sex is biological and gender is the sort of sociological presentation of yourself as being masculine or feminine, then there's no problem. You can be any gender you like and I don't really care. It doesn't make any difference. But the problem is that there is a slip and slide, bait and switch technique used all the time so that when you think you're talking about something like gender in a sociological or presentational sense it turns out you're actually talking about sex and when you talk about sex people switch to gender and you go back and forth so if you want to make a clear distinction between the two then we can make that work but then the gender recognition act should be about changing gender and not as it says on the last line about changing sex and do you think that 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 sort of rapid switching between those two terms. Do you think that is a deliberate act or it's designed to cause confusion? Or do you think that is just a legitimate confusion in this discussion that even those who are most heavily proponents of particular er things in this area get confused by themselves? <laughs> I would actually think for most part, I mean, if you read um, newspaper articles or items on, on the web, it's probably just genuine confusion. But that doesn't really explain how this happens in the drafting of a legal act. In other words, when you're drafting a legal document, you have to be very, very precise. And it doesn't explain how the mysterious transition from gender to sex happens in both the Irish Gender Recognition Act and in the UK Gender Recognition Act. And, and without being, you know, uh, without assuming malignity on the part of anybody, it would seem either to be an extraordinarily careless uh, case of legal drafting, really extraordinary, or a deliberate maneuver to of what I would think is to avoid the obvious objection from most human beings, which is that you cannot change your sex. Otherwise, it should be called the Sex Recognition Act. I mean, this, this is a point that you go through in the book at, at great mm -hmm. length, what exactly the relationship is between sex and gender and, and how interlinked they are uh, and to what degree. Mm -hmm. But it's not a conversation we generally hear in either political circles or in NGO circles. Mm -hmm. There seems to be just a fairly fluid belief, nearly that it is what is most useful at that time. Um, and yes. you know, then it'll be fine. Eventually, gender will kill off sex as an idea <laughs> entirely. And yeah. you do. Yeah. 
No, there are people. I mean, in fact, even medical practitioners who argue that your your gender identity is what is most fundamental and sex is somehow some kind of sociological construct, which to me is quite bizarre. I, I, I can't even begin to understand how somebody can seriously maintain that position. But yes, you're right. I mean, there's a whole range. I, I, I isolate at least four possible relationships between them in orders of extremity from where sex and gender are the same to where neither sex nor gender is in fact grounded in anything. And both are, to use Judith Butler's uh, phrase, performative, things that you do. So do you think there is a, a place for gender as, let's say, an anthropological or sociological uh, way of analyzing various societies? Or do you think the term has any use at all? Well, I think it does. Uh, I, I don't have an objection to the term if it's used in the following way. So let's say the distinction between male, that, sorry, human beings are distinguished into two sexes, male and female, and those your sex is determined by your functional role in procreation. It's as simple as that. In other words, if you play one role, then you're male. If you play the other, you're female. So there are only two sexes. Um, if gender is used to refer to something like a phenomenon of masculinity or femininity, of being like a man or being like a woman, according to various social ways of thinking about that, then you can have a spectrum where you have sort of extreme masculinity at one end and extreme masculinity at the other. And of course, because it's then a continuum, you can have a possibly infinite number of positions uh, in between. And if that's, if that's the way it wants to be used, then, then that's not a problem. But it does then require that one keeps very clearly in mind at all times that sex is one thing and it, you know, it's binary, okay? And gender, if you're using it in that way, is on a continuum, but then sex and gender are not the same thing and you cannot slip and slide between the two without causing immense intellectual and I would think political and legal confusion. That is something you, you do bring up in the book as well that this treating gender like this mm. in many ways enforces quite traditional ideas of what gender mm. is and before you could be a tomboyish woman or an effeminate man yeah. but as now you, you are presenting or performing as, a, as the opposite sex and therefore you are the opposite sex yeah. And that rather than freeing us from gender, <laughs> as people argued it would, if anything, it, it will just encage us even more. I, I find that quite ironic that if you're a girl, for example, who likes climbing trees and kicking footballs, then you're not a girl who likes to play football and climb trees. You're actually a boy. And if you're a boy who likes knitting and crochet and doesn't like football, you're not a boy who doesn't like football and crochets, you're actually a girl. I think that's quite extraordinary. It's, it's so regressive. I can't believe that for once, at least, I'm on the side of the angels here and regarding this as a backwards move. And one thing I, I, I did note about the book is that when you talk about radical feminists yeah. and their conception of gender, there is nearly a sense of glee <laughs> Not in how this turned out, but in a sort of <laughs> you should have seen this coming, that their arguments relating to gender would lead inevitably to where we are now. And now there's a furious backpedaling because this wasn't <laughs> what we wanted. This was not what yes. was meant to happen. Yeah. Yes. Well, I have to say, I mean, um, I, I probably do exhibit at times a sort of malicious uh, enjoyment of it. But, but in a sense, when it comes to the uh, the struggle between uh, radical feminists on the one hand and uh, transgender ideologists on the other. I'm actually on the side of the radical feminists here, uh, which sounds a bit funny for me, but but it's true. And and the reason is this, that they have found themselves to be outflanked and having created this concept of gender for their own purposes and having, if you like, subscribed to the, to the confusion for their own purposes, they now suddenly find them that the notion, they, they find that the that these notions which they have sort of invented and used have been adopted by transgender ideologists for their purposes to give them if you like a higher position in the hierarchy of victimology and therefore the things that uh, feminists have fought for many of which by the way are, are completely uh, defensible and justifiable like separate spaces for women and that sort of thing are now threatened uh, by transgender ideologists. And by the way, as we're on this point, could I make it I can't, absolutely clear because even though I spent the first chapter trying to anticipate and clarify possible confusions, 
I am not denying that people suffer from thing from a from a condition called gender dysphoria, where they experience psychologically a mismatch between their actual sex and what it is that they think themselves to be in terms of gender, in other words, in terms of masculinity and femininity. That is real. And people like that have to be treated properly and respected and so on. But it doesn't require me or anybody else for that matter to accept that their understanding of their sex, well, what sex they are, is in fact correct. It isn't. We don't do this in any other area where there are dysphorias. So for example, where somebody suffers from anorexia uh, and who, you know, somebody who thinks that they are overweight when they're actually dangerously thin and underweight, we don't say, oh, well, that's fine, just eat less. <laughs> we, we don't accept their self-perception, even though we understand that from a subjective point of view, this is actually how they experience it. So yes, I have nothing but sympathy for people in that situation, but my sympathy isn't, is, my sympathy doesn't require me, nor should it, require me or anybody else, even those who are uh, charged with treating people in this situation, to accept their self-description as a correct description of what they really are. Reading the book, it's not really a, a subject that comes up within the book, but it's one that immediately comes to mind, is a lot of this seems related to the idea of the, of the state of nature, the state of man. Mm. Are they a tabula rasa or are they shaped by their experiences? I'm just curious, to what extent do you think that some of the people on the more extreme end here are just coming from very much blank slate positions? Uh, the, well, the answer to that is, I think, quite a lot of them. That's a position I sometimes call, I don't know if I've used the term in the book, I, I've called it elsewhere, radical plasticity. And the idea is that we are, in fact, nothing in particular. Then we can, as it were, self-create uh, in any way that we desire. There is nothing, if you like, to uh, provide any resistance to our creative ability to be whatever it is we desire to be, which is a bit strange. Um, I'm a libertarian and therefore I'm in favor of freedom uh, very much, but there are certain things you can do and certain things you can't do. But let, me, let me take an example from just from the practical world. If you're working with wood, for example, there are certain things you can do when you're using wood in construction or design or in sculpture. And there are certain things you cannot do. The material you are dealing with provides a, a limit within which you have to work when you're working with your material. The same is true when you're dealing with steel or stone or clay. And so human beings, we are to an extraordinary degree free compared to the rest of the created world and other, other animals and things. And therefore we have, especially socially, a huge capacity to shape ourselves in ways that are not available to other creatures. But the, those ways are not unlimited. And the one thing we cannot do, whether we like it or not, is to change our sex. It's just not possible. However desirable it might be, it's just not possible. In the book, you, you reference Colin Wright a number of times, and I've interviewed Colin on this uh, topic uh, before. I remember I, I had asked Colin why he was so invested in this topic. And Colin said that his stance was that as a scientist, this is one of the most easily verifiable things that <laughs> human beings have two sexes and that nearly everyone falls into one of those points, that sex is not a spectrum, as they say. And so his concern was that if we can have laws and politics and social pressure that make us lie about something that is through a cursory examination, clearly and unambiguously true, there is no limit to what laws can be put in place for in other areas which are much more difficult to prove. And it reminded me, I was reminded of that when I was reading um, in the book you talk about Robert George, saying that this is a, uh, effectively a, a Gnostic cult. <laughs> and I, I've heard Robert George talk like that about it, but there does seem to be that, that and I suppose this plays back to the subtitle, the, the, the struggle against reality. There does seem to be a, a movement to argue that feeling is the only thing that matters, that, that there is no, not no reality, but that it is subservient in fact to, to feeling. I was just, is that, Roughly yeah, the feeling of the 
Yeah, well, just to take up the first point you make, it is, it is absolutely correct. I mean, um, human beings fall clearly into two sexes, apart from a minuscule, statistically minuscule number of people who are described as being intersex. In other words, these are people who, because of developmental problems in the womb, uh, have their uh, sex indicators, whether internal organs or external organs or so on, uh, not standard. Well, this is a tiny amount. Depending on, on which kind of set of criteria you use, you're, you're dealing at the maximum with something less than 1% of the total of children who are born, down to something like 0 0.0018. But here's the other interesting thing. Uh, transgenderism isn't something, if you like, intrinsically related to intersexuality. In other words, the people who are or who are transgender are people whose sexuality is completely unambiguous for the most part. It has nothing to do really with intersex, right? And this is this is what makes it strange. And of course, uh, Wright is correct in thinking that if we can be forced by legal means to, to accede to a position which is manifestly false uh, in this area, uh, then there's nothing within the scope of government to prevent it doing in other areas. In fact, I quote uh, from, a, uh, from an English peer from the 16th century who said of his, that his father had said that the parliament can do anything but make a man a woman or a woman a man, which is to say that parliament had practically unlimited powers, but it was obviously constrained by nature. And he wasn't living in the 21st century because then he would have seen that parliament can now uh, declare that a man is a woman or a woman a man, and in fact, this can be legally enforced, which is quite extraordinary. It's quite, you know, and so on. The other, the other point I wanted to make, by the way, and I, I should do it before I forget it, which is that many people who are transgender, uh, who, you know, say, men who have this feeling that somehow they're really a woman or are really more feminine than masculine, and want to. Uh, behave appropriately, whether it's in dress or behavior or manners or whatever, are quite happy to go ahead and do so quietly without walking up and down with a placard. And they are not necessarily transgender ideologists. So they're not waving a flag. And of course, uh, there is a, there's a woman, there's a transgender woman called Debbie Hayton in the UK who got into trouble with her union for saying trans women are men, get over it. <laughs> she got chast, and he or she, depending on how you want to refer to her, got chastised for saying this. So there are many people. And there are people who are transgender ideologists who aren't transgender. So there's no necessary connection between the two. And of course, my book is about transgender ideology. I'm not taking pot shots at people who want, uh, who are, as it were, transgender and just want to get on with their lives. Go ahead. That's my attitude. And in relation to... Uh... Robert George's point on Gnosticism. Oh, in Gnosticism. Well, this comes back to the radical plasticity. And um, so for, for those of your listeners who are not familiar with Gnosticism, this was a range of kind of heretical positions in early Christianity, which tended to range from downplaying the significance of the body to uh, more or less eradicating it completely, to seeing the body as uh, somehow evil, and the, the idea of salvation was to get detached from it as quickly as possible. Um, this, le this leads to two strange and contradictory attitudes. One is to a kind of moral rigorism, and the other is to a complete moral licentiousness. Because the body is not the real you, it doesn't really matter what the body does. <laughs> it's quite strange. And so I have a section in the book where I, uh, where I try to deal with this um, as clearly uh, and as simply as I can. And I, 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 one of the questions I raise is the following. Um, so if feelings determine reality, are there any limits? So for example, if I'm a man and I say, I feel I'm a woman, and we are required to say, well, that feeling now makes me to be a woman. Suppose I said, I felt I was a sheep. Would, 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 would people be prepared to say, well, that makes me sheep? And the answer, of course, is clearly no. And I'm saying, well, what's the difference? And of course, there are no irrefragible feelings that, that can't be challenged, um, that make you to be what you say you're, you feel yourself to be. And I would say the following as well. If you're a man and you say, I feel like a woman, I would ask you, 
what does that mean? Because you're not a woman and therefore whatever feelings you do have, they can only be derived as it were externally from your perception of what women are or are presented as being. Whereas from a, if you are a woman, your feeling of being a woman is given to you as part of what it is that you are. Right. So, so again, I'm puzzled by this, and I, I I propose an experiment in the book. I say to so I say at a certain stage to people, to the readers, I want you to imagine, close your eyes, and Im and imagine your what it's like to be a tree. And and I say, no, stop for a moment and really do that. And of course, if you try to do that, you kind of squint up your eyes and you say, hmm. And then you have images of large oak trees or slender poplars or whatever. But there's no way you can actually experience what it's like to be a tree. But you can't even experience what it's like to be another animal. You can't even experience what it's like to be another human being, if it comes to that. So that, if you like, undermines this whole idea that feelings are somehow clear and unambiguous and could possibly constitute a ground for what it is that you really are. It doesn't make any sense. So as you, there's an incredible breadth of references <laughs> in the book, both from people on side, but also quite a substantial listing from feminist uh, theory. I was just curious, as you were going through it, was there any theorist you ran into who not convinced you, but, you know, gave you a moment where you had to sort of go, okay, maybe that, uh, maybe that does make some sense. No. <laughs> Uh, one, sorry, well, let, 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 let me think about that again. One person, I can't quite remember her name for the moment, presented a really clear argument for why one should think that gender dysphoria should not be treated any differently from, say, anorexia, and then went on to give what she thought was an argument against it. And I found her argument for the identical treatment of all dysphorias, including gender dysphoria, to be utterly convincing and to be completely mm. mystified by the reason she presented against it. I read it again and again and again. And I'm not stupid. I simply couldn't figure out what it was that she was saying, why it was that one set of conditions was to be treated uh, as determinative of what you are and the others weren't. I could not see what the distinguishing difference was. And I've used her argument uh, for, if you like, uh, understanding all of dysphorias in the same way, because I think it's perfectly clear. I think she, she articulates it wonderfully. So that's about the only thing, if you like, that kind of gave me some pause, but that's it. Inside a, a book on a topic that, as I said, is not going to make you any friends, <laughs> you do decide to talk about a topic which, if anything, would make you even less friends, we're talking about conversion therapy. Yes. And conversion therapy combined with gender fluidity leaves you in a very strange place because you're arguing on one hand that gender can change and will over the course of your life change. And on the other hand, arguing, well, it's, it's incredibly unethical and barbaric to attempt to in any way cause that change or to facilitate it. Mm. Um, and I'm sure you're aware in the act that you reference in it, fin Senator Warfield's bill to which would ban conversion therapy is now back in the news yes. uh, without rewrite. <laughs> it is actually very interesting that, um, so this whole, this whole idea of prohibiting conversion therapy comes largely from its significance in relation to homosexuality. And there the idea is you, your relationship to the same or other sex, it's something that's somehow given and unalterable, and therefore it is both futile and unethical to attempt to change people's sexual orientation. Let that be as it is for the moment, okay? Let, let's accept that that's the case. And therefore the situation that Zen said, when it comes to your gender, the situation is exactly the same. Your gender identity is something that's simply given and unalterable, and therefore it too is futile, it is, it is, in that case, it is also futile and unethical to attempt to change it. But that runs up against the conception of gender, which tends to make sense as a position on the spectrum ranging from ultra masculinity to ultra femininity. So it turns out on this conception, your sex, your sex isn't given, 
isn't a matter of what you really are, but you're somehow your gender identity is somehow absolutely given, despite the fact that in, that when it comes to gender dysphoria, uh, which tends to arise generally when people reach the age of puberty, there is spontaneous regression to the norm amounting to 75% when it comes to males and slightly over 50% when it comes to female, which would be strange. So that if, if your gender identity, as you see it at the age of 14, were a, an unalterable aspect of your being, how is it that when you come to 21, in the case of three quarters of boys, you are actually seeing yourself now as a man rather than as a woman? That's very strange. It's a very strange idea. Um, of what is fundamental in human beings. But there's another interesting point here, which I find slightly ironic. So that in the gender, in, in the bill to prohibit conversion therapies when it comes to gender, it is to be regarded as a potential criminal offense to use psychological means to, to get somebody to accept the identity of their sex and their gender but it is completely ethical to use surgical and hormonal means to reinforce what somebody's gender is in contravention or contradistinction to their sex. It would seem, in fact, that both techniques are forms of conversion, and yet one is to be prohibited and the other is not. And of the two, I would suggest, and I think most people would probably agree with me, that whatever one thinks about psychological means of changing somebody's mind, to change somebody's body by surgery or hormones is a great deal more radical and, and a great deal more uh, of, a, of a kind of conversion than is any psychological treatment. On the, the idea of government restrictions, you also, of course, talk about hate speech and yes. the limitations uh, that that could have on, on this area. One thing I thought that was particularly interesting is when you bring up Israel Folau, yeah. And you make the point that, well, how do you define hate? Because Israel Folau says fornicators, drunkards, liars, homosexuals will go to hell if they don't repent. Yeah. And from a certain conception, that is hateful to say these things. But you make the point there that if Israel Folau legitimately believes that these people will go to hell if they don't repent, then telling them that they should repent in order to avoid this is actually an act of love. And an act of hate would be to simply let them continue. Um, yes. And so that, that seems to be the, the sort of pressing issue here. Who is going to be able to define hate? I mean, the government has now said that they will bring in laws mm -hmm. uh, regarding this, and there are no cutoffs in the general scheme of the bill that we've seen for culturally, politically, artistically important speech. Uh, I would assume based on your position as a libertarian, you think that the government should have absolutely no ability to determine if anything you say is hateful or offensive or Indeed. worthy of punishment. Yeah, absolutely. But more, more importantly, we've seen how things will go here. We've seen, for example, that those, if you're a street preacher and you stand up and you were to say, read uh, parts of the gospel, or you were to read passages from St. Paul, you could be prosecuted. And indeed, people have been prosecuted for doing this. And if it can be done on the street, there's a reason why it cannot be done in church. In the, um, the Scottish hate speech, hate crime bill, I can't remember which one it was, probably both, passed recently, in, in one of its initial formulations, even conversations, private conversations at dinner table were going to be uh, susceptible to uh, criminal sanctions if they were of the inappropriate kinds. This is extremely worrying. And I would say to people, who see themselves as being on the side of light and enlightenment here and you know feel compassion for people in these situations as in fact i do myself and think it's and therefore the speech that they see as hateful and hurtful to various groups vulnerable groups and uh as as wrong which it probably is and therefore they think it's justified that we have laws to prohibit it i would say it's not so long ago that we actually had laws which were running in the other direction and given the nature of cultural change, there is no guarantee that in the future, the, the, the mores of society won't move in a, direction, in, a, in a direction that you find unsatisfactory. And you yourself could find 
yourself at the end of the receiving line here. So you should think about what is right for everybody in all circumstances, rather than for your particular group at this particular time. So you actually talk about laws and, and government control at that level. But another topic that I found quite interesting, you also talk about the issue of schools and about curriculums mm -hmm. and curriculums being designed to reinforce particular cultural positions and you know, directives that say you must discuss things in this nature and you must include particular examples. I suppose I, I thought that section was particularly interesting, but when reading it, my immediate thought was that, well, critics will probably argue that it has always been the job of schools at some level to enculture people into societal norms. Is this not just that? Is this actually something objectionable? Or is it just a continuation of an accepted uh, policy? No, that's a very good point, and I think uh, largely correct. And therefore, the cultural norms which schools are used to uh, in, to, as it were, I suppose you could say, indoctrinate, in, not in a bad sense necessarily, into students, um, reflect the kind of ethos of the society around them. I'm not sure, by the way, that in this case, those, the society at large has, in fact, this particular ethos, I suspect, that's being driven by a small sort of radical group within government and, and, uh, and uh, agencies uh, which have a disproportionate effect on government. But even if it were so, come back to the larger libertarian point, which is that schools shouldn't be following a curriculum that's dictated by a central authority. Whatever norms that they're actually putting, whether they're norms of which you would approve or norms of which you would disapprove. Schools, when you think about it, are surrogates for parents. And therefore, by and large, uh, any school to which you send your child should be a school that, broadly speaking, reflects and reinforces the norms of the parents whose children are going to that school. So would you say then that in this case, these curriculums, rather than fairly representing societal norms in broader society, are more of an issue of, shall we say, the dominance of a small group yes. seeking to get those rights yes. into the wider society? Yes. Absolutely. So you talk in the book a lot about transgenderism. But you also talk about a very interesting topic that we're only starting to hear of the last few years, and I think is starting to happen faster than anyone really anticipated, which is the phenomenon of detransitioners. Mm. These, for, for the listener, are people who have changed their gender and have now gone back the other way after seeing that the results were not what they would thought they would be or that for whatever reason, there, there's as many as there are people. And I'm just curious what, what your thoughts are on the issue of transitioning. I know we've had the Kira Bell case recently, which the book mentions, but the book was written, I assume, before the judgment, so you don't really have much time to, to go into it. And it's been a very, it was very interesting judgment, I thought. Mm. Um, the findings of that court were, were, I would say, quite damning to many of the things that had happened in the Tavistock. I was just curious if you had a thought on that as, as you couldn't get it into the book because you were already done by that point. So what you're referencing is the case of Kira Bell, who as a young woman who underwent transition uh, during the course of which she had fairly radical surgery. She had her breasts removed uh, and so on. And this was quite significant. And uh, some years later, she realized that, that what she had done and what it had the implications it had for her life and her family life in the future. And she argued that she didn't get the advice uh, in a sort of detached and objective way that she should have received. And that she was more or less, I don't want to get into legal trouble here, but that she was more or less kind of forced or guided or at least not sufficiently challenged. I think that's the word she used. She wasn't sufficiently challenged when she uh, said that she thought she was male and she, she should have been. And so she's taken legal action. And I argue in the book, even though I didn't know the outcome of the case uh, when I wrote that, I suspect that if change is going to come in this area, especially for those who are legally incompetent, in other words, those who are underage by and large or otherwise not capable of making legally binding decisions, that changes will come about because of legal action that will be taken and the costs that are ensued. And that will bring about uh, a um, significant change in how certainly underage uh, underage children 
are treated in this area. Right now, we've seen a virtual explosion in referrals for gender dysphoria and then decisions being taken, which can have a permanent effect on people's lives. So even if, even if you discount surgery, which obviously is un, irreversible, um, hormonal treatment too can have non-reversible effects. The NHS used to have, I, I, I detail this in the book, had a page up uh, on uh, hormonal treatment. And they changed that in the last year, just before I finished writing the book, in which they started to point out that they weren't absolutely certain that you couldn't change uh, the, the outcome of what you did with hormones and that people should be aware of this and so on, which I thought was a significant uh, addition and an, indeed a significant change in sort of policy from the NHS. Yes, we, we've seen that with Irish groups as well. I mean, the HSE, the ICGP had on their, uh, on their guidelines for GPs that they were fully reversible. They got rid of those after I contacted them <laughs> for a comment. Yeah, which is, is never great if a medical authority has that sort of trigger to pull material. <laughs> to suggest they may not have looked at it with a, a great deal of fully therapy. reversible. Yeah, but when we when we look at this, and we, looking at this from from the perspective of trying to maximize good or minimize harm that is dealt to people here, when the NHS was saying that these were fully reversible, now they've moved to long term uh, complications are unknown. Mm -hmm. But even they will accept that permanent sterility is absolutely uh, a likelihood with some of these procedures. Yes. You would have um, loss of sexual function. Mm. And I know that came up in the Kira Bell case with the judge saying that someone who's 12 cannot conceptualize what it means to be sterilized or to lose sexual function in the way an adult can, because how could yes. they? Because yeah, absolutely. Gone true. There seems to be a substantial potential here for a great deal of harm to be dealt to people, particularly children. Mm. And it does seem slightly odd that we, the arguments for this are usually based on empathy and we have to help these people. But it seems if you, if you take a more long-term view, the potential for harm is, seems rather incredible and, and clearly so. Indeed. Uh, one of the um, basic principles of medicine is primum non nocere, which means first of all, do no harm. So when you're treating a condition, the treatment shouldn't be such as to make things worse. You may not make things better, but at least you shouldn't make things worse. And while, as I said earlier, gender dysphoria is a genuine psychological state or condition, I'm not necessarily saying it's pathological, but if there is obviously something odd going on if you're male and you think you're female or if you're female and you think you're male. And as I said earlier, most uh, adolescents uh, regress certain, more in the case of boys uh, than girls, but nonetheless, it, it, it does seem odd that in dealing with this, you would be willing fairly easily as the Tavistock Clinic was apparently, I think I'm correct in saying this, to go for measures that are in fact irreversible. Uh, when people are making this decision, quote unquote, at an age when they really don't have the ability to conceive of what the long term effects will be. Again, I make clear, by the way, in the book when, that if competent adults want to make these kinds of decisions, however misguided I might think them, they are entirely free to do so. They should be free to do so. In fact, I would defend their right to make those decisions if they wanted to do that. But what adults choose to do is one thing, what what children do is another. I suppose the just a question there, particularly from your your libertarian perspective, hmm. proponents of this will say that children should have the right to self determination, to bodily self determination, and they should be allowed to make these choices, regardless of what adults think, and that that is necessary uh, to respect the rights of children. And I'm just curious what what you think of that, given that your your personal philosophy is. Yeah. based largely around the idea of liberty. Do you think you so, can extend it like that? No, I, I can see that point. That point has, in fact, been urged against me. And so I would say I would put the following and I'm going to take an extreme case just to make the point. Um, if you're two year old. And two year olds tend to be kind of rambunctious, OK, uh, is with you and wants to cross the road on his own. 
your attitude is, I don't care what you want, buddy. And I don't care about your self-determination. You're holding my hand and we cross this road together. And the reason for that is simple. The child is not in a position to make a reasonable judgment of what the dangers are and therefore is what I would call legally incompetent. Now, I would argue that the way we have of determining legal competence by setting a specific age is probably misguided. And there are certain people probably who are legally competent at the age of 14 or 15 or 16, and other people are probably not legally competent at the age of 25. But given the, and the legal environment in which we live and the fact that legal competence is determined by, is age related, then I don't see that it's, a, it's an argument against my position to say that uh, I fully respect the right of people who are legally competent to make whatever decision they like in this area, but that people who are legally incompetent uh, should be protected from that until such time as they are legally competent and then they can make the decision. There, there's not an issue here, by the way, of having to make a decision at this moment or else the moment has passed. In other words, if, yeah, in other words if, if, if they're not allowed to transition at the age of 13, they can do so at the age of 18. I think that the proponents of younger interventions here would argue that post-puberty, uh, these interventions are much less successful in that it is a lot easier to, let's say, feminize the body of someone who has not gone through male puberty than it is to feminize the body of someone who has gone through it and that that would then have an impact on their final outcome and thus on their mental health as well as arguing that if these people are in mental pain due to the dysphoria hmm. saying that well you've got to wait you know five six seven years is is cruel uh well yes i, I mean you could say that i don't agree <laughs> with that actually um it's, it doesn't override my basic point that if, the, if you judge, uh, as we do in the case of children uh, and young people generally, that they are not competent to make certain decisions at a certain age, this is not denying them the fundamental rights, it's asking them to demonstrate that they have this competence and to accept the results that they choose to do so. Um, and this is, in, in this case, even though there's a hard and fast line drawn at, at a particular age, that's the best we can do in the current circumstances. Uh, that being said, you know, when it comes to, let me come back to the point about detransitioning. A significant number of people uh, have, in fact, not only Kira Bell, but others have come to a realization that the changes they have made uh, were not the best thing for them. And like Bell, they're not particularly happy that they were not challenged more strongly in their earlier decisions to make those particular changes. So they might have thought about them a little bit more carefully as it were, but were, um, what's the word I want? In, helped as it were to have their decisions based upon their feelings, which as I've pointed out in many cases are transitory, uh, affected in such a way that the uh, changes to their body, permanent changes to their bodies have been made that they, in some cases, obviously, we're quite happy with and continued with, but in some cases, we're not. And given the radical nature of the kind of changes, both surgical and hormonal, I don't think it's, it's appropriate uh, for the for these changes to be allowed to be made to those who are legally incompetent. However, we define that particular category. Just put, as a final question before we, we close up, Jared, where do you think this will go in the future? Do you think we are going to see uh, let's say the spreading of gender recognition acts of the type we've seen in Ireland abroad? Or do you think that there is going to be sort of a movement back from this, that cases like the Kira Bell case will lead to a certain amount of questioning of the evidence base here? The answer, I think, depends on whether you take a short term or long term view. Short term, I think the answer is we're going to see an increasing number of jurisdictions adopt something like a gender recognition act. But I think long, medium to long term, I'm going to, we're going to see, uh, I think, a reversal uh, of those because it's clearly um, whatever they're attempting to achieve, if what you're attempting to achieve is some legal recognition of people's gender, where gender is understood in the sense I talked about earlier, 
uh, somebody's expression along a continuum of masculinity and femininity, then you would say, well, they're, these are unproblematic. They're actually unnecessary. In other words, I don't see why it should be of anybody's interest, legal interest, whether somebody presents themselves as being hyper masculine or hyper feminine or anything in between. Why, why is that significant? Okay, any more than whether you like music or don't like music or football or whatever it might be. All of these things are humanly important, but they're not necessarily something that has to be sort of legally recognized and the recognition then enforced on others. Um, so as long as the confusion and conflation of sex and gender continues, then we're going to have all of these conversations. And so, for example, I can see myself now on a hostile TV studio with somebody uh, t saying, I don't, I, I don't, you know, people have different genders and I'm saying, yeah, I, I don't have a problem with that. And then they say, well, then they've got different sexes. And I go, no, that doesn't follow from what we're talking about. And, and we could have this incredibly frustrating conversation where they slip back and forth and making various points um, and asking me, you know, do I accept this and will I accept that? And I will try to distinguish uh, as clearly as I can uh, the issues here. But as if you just read the papers um, and articles, uh, even from people who would probably be generally sympathetic to my largely conservative views, you'd find that they too slip between uh, sex and gender without sort of realizing that they're not, in fact, the same thing and cannot be the same thing if they are to mean anything. But so, yeah, I think we're going to get a, we're going to get a kickback on it because, as your scientist friend that you mentioned earlier said, if the government can, uh, by law, determine that this distinction, which is so blatantly obvious that, as I say in my preface, I'm embarrassed actually to have to write a book about it because it's so obvious. Uh, if they can enforce on us ways of speaking that are manifestly untruthful, then we're in serious trouble. And just to make my point again, I'm not really concerned with what other people do. I'm not telling any competent adult that they cannot do what they want to do or present themselves in any way that they present themselves. I'm really not interested in that. I am concerned with the fact that we have laws in our statute books, which will end up and have done and are doing, making people like Maya Forstetter, for example, in the UK, who lost her job two years ago because she expressed gender critical views. She's now going through a review of this in the, in the appeals court. Um, and others, even, even the sacrosanct JK Rowling, hero to, to millions of people and and generally PC friendly in an extreme way has been attacked because she has dared to suggest, wait for it, that women are women and men are men. And even I, I, I smiled just recently, just, just a couple of days ago, uh, Caitlyn Jenner, who used to be Bruce Jenner, uh, an Olympic uh, decathlon champion, came out and said he didn't think that transgender girls should be allowed to participate in girls' school sports because he said it is unfair. And so I, I wrote a short piece, which hasn't been published yet, which says something like the following. Well, look, if transgender girls are girls, then there's no principal reason why they shouldn't participate in girls' school sports. It doesn't make any sense. And if you argue that they shouldn't do so because they're stronger or faster than, than non-transgender girls, that's not really the case either, because, of course, lots of girls who are non-transgender, unproblematically girls, as it were, are actually stronger and faster than others. We don't prohibit those from taking part in girls' school sports. So here's the issue. Either transgender girls are girls or they're boys. If they're boys, they shouldn't be taking part in girls' sports. And if they're girls, they should. You cannot have it both ways. Which is it? <laughs> Thank you. Professor Jared Casey, author of Hidden a Gender, Transgenderism's Struggle Against Reality. If you're interested in picking up a copy of the book, I believe Hidden a Gender, uh, Beyond Me Too and Zap are currently on sale in Imprint Academic, is it Jared? That's correct, yes. And you can pick them up there for, uh, I think, quite a reasonable price at the minute. 25 pounds sterling. Postage paid. <laughs> I was going to say that's only a trip to the cinema, but you can't legally go to the cinema anymore. So <laughs> It would have been a trip to the cinema. Also available, of course, obviously on uh, Amazon and on Book Depository for those who don't want to inflict three of my books upon themselves, which is perfectly understandable. <laughs> All the best. All the best. Thank you, Gary.